Welcome back. We're going to move on now and talk about mechanical damage to ecosystems and those impacts that are associated with fishing. So, to start with mechanical damage. Now, one of the major causes of mechanical damage is uh, humans' preoccupation with clearing habitat. And we do this for a variety of reasons. We do it because we need to clear coastal areas to build houses and resorts and coastal infrastructure like ports. Sometimes we want to clear areas of mangroves to provide building materials, for example. We might want to dredge the seabed so that we can create new sediment that we can then use to extend the area of the land and reclaim land from the sea. There's many, many reasons why we do this. And here's an example of some of the problems that can follow from doing it. Now, this is an example from the Irrawaddy River Delta of Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. Now, this is an area that's a big natural river delta, and conventionally, or historically, this was dominated by mangroves. But because of pressures for food, large areas have been cleared to provide rice paddies, so we can provide more rice. Now, if you go back into the sort of early 1970s, those areas in the kind of yellow colour that you can see there were areas that were cleared in about a 15 year period, fast areas. Then the pink areas were cleared in the next decade, and what you can see that's left in blue is the amount of mangrove that's left today. Now, it's a, it's a tiny fragment of what used to be there. Now, there's a number of problems that this causes. Principally, as you remove the amount of mangrove, more and more soil washes off into the rivers, into the delta, and that makes it shallower and shallower. One of the problems that this causes is that when you have some kind of flood event, maybe it's a tsunami, maybe it's a large storm, that that water, as it approaches the coast, because it's now traveling over a very shallow area of delta, it's much easier for it to move higher up and, and swamp the land and cause a flooding event. But it's also worse because by removing the mangroves that used to be there, what we're actually doing is making it easier for that wave energy to move up onto land because you're losing that sort of natural protection. And we'll be talking about that, about that a lot more in the next lecture. So what this means is that for coastal people living there, they're much more vulnerable to flood events. And so in 2008, a very large typhoon struck this area and it had devastating consequences. And this is a general problem that affects uh, uh, deltas like this the world over. And it's estimated that about 85% of the world's major river deltas are flooded every year. And it's expected that with increasing sea level, that by the end of this century, there'll be about a 50% increase in the amount of delta that's regularly going underwater because of these sorts of problems. So a second sort of mechanical damage is dredging. And we dredge stuff from the seabed for a variety of reasons. Sometimes we're doing it because we're trying to increase the size of a port and we need to make navigation channels deeper. And sometimes we do it because we want to create sediment and sand that we can then sort of dump into shallow coastal waters to create new land, reclaim land that we can then build on. And here's an amazing example of this from uh, the Palm Jumeirah uh, development in Dubai. And here we have a series of satellite images that document the tremendous development of new land and new resorts and living areas off the coast of Dubai. And this was an incredible scale. So it took nine years to complete. It increased the size of the coastline by 520 kilometers, and it generated 94 million cubic meters of sand. That's enough to fill 44,000 Olympic swimming pools. But that's not the only kind of damage that we do, of course. One of the biggest sources of damage occurs through fishing and the use of trawls. And trawls are used, these are uh, heavy trawls that we tow behind boats. The trawls are moving along the seabed. They're used to catch things like shrimp, for example. And as they move along, they can very seriously damage the seabed and anything that's living there. And what we're looking at here is a satellite image of part of the northern Great Barrier Reef. And if you look carefully, you can see some small scars through the seagrass areas there. And these are areas where these dredges have been towed through the seabed and leaving a very persistent 
scar that we can even see from space. And these scars can take a very long time to heal. Now, we've started talking about fishing, but fishing has a wide variety of different impacts on ecosystems. And, and to a large extent, much of it can be unsustainable. And so we know that historically, we've been over-exploiting marine resources um, you know, for really remarkably long periods of time. Um, one of the most fascinating things, I think, is that in the Caribbean, you can go back as archaeologists and go back to what they call middens, which are the kind of historical rubbish dumps that indigenous Indians created uh, maybe 2,000 years ago. And what you can do, or what people have done, is look at these middens and look at what kinds of fish people were consuming and then leaving their skeletons behind. You can look at the skeleton, you can measure the skeleton, you can identify what kind of species it was, and then you can go and find a midden that might be 500 years uh, into the future. So maybe we're comparing nearly 2,000 years ago to towards maybe 1,000 years ago. And you find that the same type of fish is now smaller. So that's evidence that even 2,000 years ago, we were over-exploiting some of the local shallow fisheries. So it's really quite remarkable. Um, another example of that is turtles, of course. And turtles, we've already uh, been talking about, but it's estimated that Caribbean green turtles have declined about 15-fold um, since more natural levels. Now, the reasons that we fish unsustainably are partly because there's more and more people but also we've become better and better at catching fish. And here's an example of a big purse seine that can catch an entire school of fish in one fell swoop. So we've become very, very efficient predators ourselves. And if you look at historical catches, this is the catch data that's accumulated by the Fish and Agricultural Organization, then this is what pattern you see for global fisheries catch. Up from about 1950 to 1990, catches were increasing. Then, for 1990 onwards, they tend to level off. So you might be tempted to think, well, OK, so maybe humanity is, is catching a sustainable uh, constant level now. But let's look at how much effort we expend in trying to catch it. And this is just one measure of effort. This is the amount of energy people are using to try and uh, harvest that fish. And it's increasing almost exponentially. So this means that we're expending a much greater amount of effort to catch the same amount of fish. It means that the fishery is much less productive now than it used to be. And this, of course, is a big concern. It's perhaps not surprising when you see how much we're now having to work to catch fish these days that we are increasingly over-exploiting our fisheries. And by over-exploiting, I mean that we're harvesting more fish than is considered sustainable or optimally sustainable. And that in time, that will have a negative effect on the fishery, winding it downwards. So if we go back to 1974, at that time, only about 10% of the world's fisheries were considered over-exploited. Now, that number has risen threefold to 30%. And so we're doing a much worse job of managing fisheries overall. But I will add a caveat to that, in that it's not all doom. There are some parts of the world and certain fisheries that are now managed a lot better. It's just that that's set against a backdrop of sort of declining quality of fisheries management and over-exploitation. One of the things that happens as we do that is called fishing down the food web. And we might start by fishing the most desirable predatory fish at the top of the food chain. The sharks, the tunas, the big jacks, the big snappers, the groupers. And as they become... Uh, rarer and rarer, and part of the reason for that is because they tend to be uh, very vulnerable to fishing. They tend to grow slowly, they reproduce at a fairly late age, and therefore it's easy to overexploit them. And as we do that, we sort of shift down towards smaller and smaller bodied fish, often lower and lower down the food chain. This has been termed fishing down the food chain, chain by Daniel Pauly. And so we can see this graphically by looking at some historical photographs of um, fishing tournaments that were done in the key west of the Florida Keys. Now, in the 1950s, this is the catch people were, were collecting. These are the trophy fish, and they're pretty impressive. There's big groupers there, there's big jacks, there's even a shark or two. If we move forward to the 1980s, there's far fewer impressive fish on that board. There's still a few nice-looking groupers, perhaps, but it's a pretty sorry-looking tail. If we now move forward 
to the more present day, it's an extremely unimpressive tail. And these are uh, the fish that have been caught with anglers that are perhaps using even better techniques now. So um, it's really a very sort of uh, uh, sort of damning insight into how we've overexploited um, recreational fisheries over a, a long period of time. Okay. Now, one of the problems that fishing out these big fish causes is that big fish play a disproportionately large role in sustaining the next generation. If you look at a 60 centimeter coral trout like this, it will generate 3 million eggs. If we look at a slightly smaller coral trout, this one's only 40 centimeters, so it's about two thirds of the size, it only generates one tenth of the number of eggs of the slightly larger fish. So there's this disproportionate relationship. And what that means is that when we manage fisheries, not only do we have to worry about avoiding catching the smallest individuals that aren't yet old enough to reproduce, but we also should think about protecting the largest individuals because they have a disproportionately big impact on the next generation. And so typically what we do in many fisheries now is look to fish a slot or an intermediate range of size classes to try and um, uh, minimize the impact on the sustainability of the fishery. Okay. But fisheries have other impacts on ecosystems. This is the most desperate example. This is dynamite fishing. We're now crossing a relatively good bit of coral reef. You can see all those fish in amongst the coral heads there, the, the patchwork of, of staghorn coral. And this is an area of reef in Indonesia that's been dynamited. And what's left is just a pile of rubble. And you can see that there are very few fish associated with this. And this is a type of fishing that happens when people are really desperate to catch fish and that they'll be using dynamite, it's very dangerous to them, and it has a very persistent negative effect on the ecosystem. It takes a long time for a reef to recover from that. So this is kind of the worst case scenario, and it's rife in some parts of the world, unfortunately.